Liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waltman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waltman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, November 11th. 2024, time for another show, time for Veterans Day. Uh, so goodbye. It's time to get off the air and uh, forget about the show. In honor of our veterans, or as, of course, the president-elect refers to them, suckers and losers. It's uh, last Veterans Day, I suppose. We'll switch the name by next year. And, uh, well, lots of things are changing. Uh, much change afoot. Over the weekend, uh, I guess we're now back in the Trump era, I suppose, which means our weekends are lost to uh, having to track more stories of fear and paranoia and weirdness. And uh, that's what we'll be doing. Friday was a day away from the microphone. You probably still hear the cold lingering in the background just a little bit. I think the voice is strong enough to make it through here today, particularly if we have the help of Greg Dworkin, as we expect in the first Half to well, you it used to be that it was just we only demanded a quarter of the show from him, and now we get a good half of the show out, right? And it helps and it'll help keep the voice rested. So, for the first few minutes, it's you, me, and a cold ease lozenge, which I, I forgot how long these things actually take to dissolve. I figured, you know, hey, five minutes before the show, that would be the time to take that lozenge and try and uh, shape things up with the voice and uh. Various other things that uh, come along with the cold. But no, these things dissolve over the course of about, so, I don't know, 16, 17 hours. So it'll keep me busy all day. So, all right, well, we'll, we'll have an extra guest on the show. And we'll interview my coldies lozenge to ask, uh, what was your secret to surviving the election? This is, this is uh, everybody's feature over the weekend, too. So lots to catch up on. There's lots of analysis going on. There's still votes outstanding to be counted, and that has changed a lot of the flash, eh, if not analysis, worries, I think, about uh, the results of the election. Um, you know, we were admonished to wait until all the counting is done before we decide whether or not there were X number of voters missing from the turnout this time around, or what it would mean. And of course... Uh, the story was also chock full of, uh, uh, the weekend was full of stories that were, I guess, I don't know what they were designed to do, but they, they confused me. They probably confused you. And so, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the value of them is really in the end, um, to read stories about people who said, well, I thought about it and uh, I agreed that he was Hitler, but I voted for him because, you know, and sometimes they give a reason, sometimes they don't, uh, Sometimes the reason is obviously wrong on its face, but whatever. There's a lot of misinformation and a lot of disinformation. And then, of course, uh, we've just elected an administration, if you want to call it that, that uh, aims at removing the reference to disinformation or misinformation. Stop calling it misinformation. It's just regular information. Everything you knew growing up and for the last 250 years of the country is wrong. And we're redefining it. Of course, we've told you that story for a long time. Armando has told you that story for a long time about how that uh, works with legal precedent. And there are new ones set to uh, come rolling down the pike any day. And we can imagine many of them as we've been given hints from the Roberts Court all along and in the last couple of months in particular, especially about uh, presidential immunity. We'll still have to figure out what that one means. And then... Uh, changes on the congressional front as well. I guess the the top story in terms of, hey, everything you thought you knew about the way your government worked is actually wrong now. Uh, Donald Trump, it falls to Donald Trump to name members of his cabinet, uh, you know, department and bureau chiefs at the next level down from the cabinet, uh, judges, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, a, a vast number of appointments coming. It looks like Republicans have one control of the Senate, so ordinarily you would say now that they will have no problem uh, ra- uh, 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 approving of those appointments. And uh, 
that's not enough for Donald Trump. He wants to hit the ground running and move very fast. And, of course, he still loves having his actings. We have to bring back our, uh, yes, our, our boost the sound on that, too, maybe. I'll ask the engineers to work on giving us more volume on that. But he's definitely moving back in that direction. In fact, uh, he's already anticipating that any delay would be too much. And he wants to have his cabinet on the ground and running before he even lands and has essentially issued the demand that now that there is a contest to replace Mitch McConnell for Senate Republican leader, the uh, those auditioning for the part, the people running, uh, must, in his view, all swear to him that they will do away with the process of advice and consent of the Senate on major appointments like this and just allow him to appoint them either on an acting basis or allow him to appoint them while the Senate is in recess so there can be no delays on anybody or anything. And guess what? As it turns out, the people who wrote the Federalist Papers who figured that Congress would jealously guard its prerogatives as against the other branches, it turns out no, that is not the case. One guy has taken over the party. Those people are members of the party, and so they will knuckle under all, I think, of the contestants for the Republican leadership race have so far given their tacit agreement to just jumping out of the way. And we can explain the mechanism of that and how it would actually work. Uh, but, you know, so much for separation of powers and balance as between the branches. The president is usually entitled to their nominees anyway, and it's very rare that a nominee for a cabinet position, certainly, is rejected. And uh, so in that sense, it was unnecessary. But the the pace at which those positions are filled is too slow for him. And so why don't we get rid of this part of the Constitution, too? We got rid of the part that said that people who were insurrectionists couldn't run for office. So it should be pretty easy to get rid of this, too. Besides, I mean, his record, uh, his, his record versus the Constitution is is undefeated. Right. There's no emoluments clause. There's no uh, 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 disqualification for insurrectionism and uh, no advice and consent of the Senate necessary anymore either. Uh, if they want to engineer it that way, they can make it happen. So we'll see. That won't stop him from taking pot shots at the people who are running. Nonetheless, uh, John Cornyn is in the running and Trump feels that he's too much of a rhino, of course, uh, super rhino that he is. Uh, Rick Scott, I think, is the one who might end up with Trump's endorsement for this. Uh, I think John Thune is also in the running. Um, so not 100 percent sure. Maybe he thinks he can keep a closer eye on Rick Scott because he's down in Florida and from his throne in, in Pervalago, he'll be able to keep him under his thumb. Or maybe he just thinks he looks like a thumb. That could be it also. Uh, so, you know, interesting times. Uh, things that you thought were basic bedrock constitutional principles. As it turns out, you know, maybe not so much. You got to get over your attachment. There is some other news out there that might be uh, a little more enjoyable, or at least temporarily. We'll get to it, but first we'll give Greg Dworkin a crack at uh, telling us what he thinks is going on. Hey, good morning, Greg. Hey, good morning. So your voice uh, seemed to last through that. Yeah, I made it through that. That's it. See ya. Okay, bye. Okay. I'm resting now. Me so and the lozenge. two points to bring up about what you mentioned about the Senate leadership thing. And, I, you know, had it not been for Trump, I think John Thune may well have won. Mm. However, Trump not only is trying to change the way the Senate does appointments, as you pointed out, He's also trying to change the way the Senate elects leaders. Yes. He tells them what to do and they do it. That's his idea of how you elect a leader. That is simple and direct and to so the point. So he said, do Scott, don't do Thune. So that's yeah. the end of Thune. Okay. Because I have no faith whatsoever in the Republican Congress. No, and there's no reason to have that faith. And and even Cornyn, who he's against on this one thing of why don't you jump out of the way on uh, appointments, he said, yeah, we could do that. Well, Cornyn's spineless, so, you know, it had had he been there, he actually may be a um, a good choice for Trump because Cornyn basically would do whatever Trump wants. Mm -hmm. Scott, Rick Scott, also would do whatever Trump wants, but Scott's a little more transactional. He'd actually ask something for it. 
Maybe, yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, uh, Thune, I think, would oppose some of this stuff. So that's why I think Thune is no. out. Well, that, yeah, I mean, you know, it's very difficult to tell the difference. They don't authority. want an institutionalist. No, that, that seems clear. Uh, I didn't really think of him much as an institutionalist, but I guess it Compared explains something. Others. I guess so. All right. Well, that explains uh, what terrible thing they were doing in that very narrow niche. Are there other terrible things? You know, and and the other point, perhaps the uh, you know fifty thousand foot point about all of the uh, uh, maneuverings to see yes. who the new Senate uh, majority leader would be, is that what Trump is doing? Of course, you'd think that the Congress would respond with their prerogatives and push back the way Harry Byrd used to in a very fierce kind of way. However, they've realized that their voters Robert. want everything blown up. Hmm. They've internalized it. It's not so much that they accept Trump and they're, they're into Trumpism. They're afraid of their base. They understand the base wants everything blown up. This was an election where people voted to blow everything up. Even yes. Democrats voted to blow everything up because they're not happy with Democrats. And, and we talked about that a little bit last week. I think we need to talk about it more this week. Uh, but the whole idea is you got to blow stuff up. So if you're going to blow stuff up, you're going to pick the leader who's most likely to do it. That's Rick Scott. Hmm. Okay. Yes, I, well, I guess so. He sure looks like a guy who would blow something up. He doesn't care. Yeah. This is not the way we usually do things. Well, fine, I'll do it some other way. I, I didn't no really understand. I what, have no yeah. history. I don't care. <laughs> I didn't understand what the, how we did things when I was doing them. So, all right. Yeah, I, he's he's certainly the the most Lex Luthor ish. Uh, Skeletor. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I've heard I've heard that as well. The, he said I could call him either one. Yeah, well, it's it's who he looks like. Yeah. So, all right. uh, you know, there's there's some things. Um, the things I wanted to talk about this morning go back to, uh, you know, still part of the analysis about what's going on. One of the interesting uh, tweets I saw this morning, which I didn't send you, was Nate Silver's <laughs> prediction. Oh, thank you. Yeah. About what the final vote's going to look like. Oh, big numbers, commas. Yeah. Well, you know, he's Stuff predicting like that. that in the end, Trump's going to get around, uh, I think, uh, maybe two million more than Harris, which okay. isn't as much as it looked on election day. And that his total yes. percentage might not actually hit 50, which would be fun. He might oh. get 49.9. Yeah, okay, you know. I, I like the idea that, okay, he didn't get a majority. <laughs> that would be that'd be something. I like to, th I like to I say that it is a majority. would make me feel better. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in which case, I would grant it to you. If I were Donald Trump, but, uh, you know, we used to say Republicans don't get majorities, you know, except for yeah. Trump. Well, I'd, I'd like it better if I said Just say, Republicans that's right. generally don't. don't get majorities. Meh. Yes. Okay. Well, that would be good. And we can allow for a good thing, even though Nate Silver may have said it. The other thing is you have to keep in mind uh, that as you hear some of the analysis that happens, some of it is just anger. Some of it is just uh, finger pointing because it's got to be everybody else's fault but mine. Some of it is insightful in terms of giving insight. Mm -hmm. A tiny bit of it is insightful in terms of trying to start a riot. Uh, <laughs> but most of it is pretty decent. It's just that you have to uh, remember there's no one thing that made the Democrats lose the election. So no, one if somebody trick. said, well, it was this, and you go, no, it was that, you know, why not both? Yeah. We're both right. It's, uh, yeah, right. So, you know, uh, uh, try wax, not to be too simplistic. You know. But also, uh, it's a question of, of not necessarily blaming. Everybody wants to blame the campaign. It's absolutely the wrong thing to do. All right. You felt let down by them. You, you they, they were confident right. they were going to win, and they didn't. Well, actually, you know. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, they did okay. Um, the the numbers are probably that uh, they got their marks. They uh, predicted they were going to get a certain number of votes. They got them. They probably exceeded them. That's where their ground game helped. Okay. Uh, they didn't, like in 2016, anticipate there'd be a bunch of voters they didn't see coming who uh, came out and voted for Trump. So they mm. got swamped. I mean – 
I I am very mindful of when that happened, and I don't think of 2016 so much as I think uh, of uh, of uh, 2004, Ohio and Kerry. Hmm. We thought Kerry was going to win Ohio. Kerry got all the votes he thought he needed. He got every single vote his campaign said we need to win. And what they didn't oh, right. anticipate is that George Bush was going to bunch, going to get a bunch more on top of that that they didn't see coming. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what happened this time too. And yes, it was the white non-college evangelicals, um, and and of their ilk. This time it was uh, a smattering of that plus uh, uh, conservative white non-college voters. But one of the facts about that is that Gen Z voted for Harris, millennials voted for Harris, mm-hmm. and X voted for Trump and elected him, and boomers voted for Harris. Oh, you know, the numbers. Well, yeah, right. We heard that. Well, so when you start hearing about, well, Joe Rogan and and, uh, and podcasts and stuff like that, because that's oh. the next piece I'm going to give you, you have yes. to remember that more than 50% of Rogan's podcast and most podcasts are young people. Young yes. people were not the determinant in this election. They were a factor. It would have mm-hmm. been nice if they went for Harris more. I'm not saying it didn't have any influence. But Gen X is the one that elected Trump, and Rogan's target audience is not Gen X, is what I'm saying. That's certainly true. I wondered whether he was responsible for turning out some of the people that nobody saw coming. But Some. You know, you know, uh, in every area, the fact that younger males came out in bigger numbers than people thought they would uh, might be him. But that was not the determinative thing. That's why when you look at the analysis, you just have to keep in mind it's complicated. There's a lot of things going on. Yes, it may have been that he helped turn out in that group. That's not the group that was determinative. I'm not sure what kind of Latino listeners he has, for example. Hmm. I don't yes. know. I uh I but imagine there's some significant I imagine number. there's some younger Latinos that listen, yes. but I don't think that that was the uh, dominating factor mm, in the Latino no, probably vote, swung not. heavily for Trump. I don't think it was Rogan on that. No, I, I, mean, I don't think so. I, there's no reason to uh, – and, and there's also no reason to think that – I don't think that Rogan is – I don't know. I don't listen very often if at all, but I hear clips, but I've never heard him say anything that would turn off a large Latino audience like that. Puerto Rico is garbage. He doesn't do that, I don't think. But I don't know. Maybe he does. But at any rate, it doesn't matter because, as you pointed out, yeah, the problem was elsewhere. What are they listening? What am I listening to? I don't know. So uh, a couple of things here. This is a a piece uh, on uh, Twitter, which you don't have to go to because I thread readered it, so you don't have to go to that site. All right. It's called uh, Peter, uh, Peter Twinklage is the name. Who now? And he says, uh, to the extent that there's connective tissue between the Dems who considerably outperform Harris in competitive districts, and there were a lot of them, by the way, Gallego, Guzen Camp Perez in Washington, Mm -hmm. uh, Pat Ryan, it seems that they all champion progressive policies while wrapping themselves in conservative cultural coding. Hmm. Ryan campaigned with AOC in the Hudson Valley and made a point to highlight his military service. Glucin Camp Paris co-sponsored a bill to protect medication abortion while constantly talking about her history as a flannel-clad car mechanic. Gallego never apologized for his tenure in the House Progressive Caucus, but he also aggressively pursued male voters with soccer and boxing match watch parties. I think he sponsored a rodeo. Hmm. <laughs> hey, me too. I just – I should do that. I mean, so so all of them, he says, spoke proudly in defense of queer Americans – but never condemning constituents who lack the language to voice their concerns about certain issues in a politically correct fashion. So having grown up on a farm with a Fox News family, I think this is the way forward. Hmm. And I think that there's a point, and that's why we didn't particularly phrase it that way before the election, but that's why I always gave a pass to people. I said, look, it's a big tent, you know, you've got to understand the constituency. Give a pass to Jared Golden. Give a pass uh, to a certain extent. For Joe Manchin. Yes, he's a jerk, but look at the appointments he votes for. Uh, Kristen Cinema voted for Chuck Schumer as leader. I mean, as much as you may dislike them, as much as they're jerks, hmm. uh, they they did a certain amount of conservative coding 
to stay viable in their view. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, Cinema was wrong about everything, but you know that that was the gameplay. It didn't work. Yes, and there That's are many other dings. And Mansion, we're talking about West Virginia, so you know, there's no mm. way that Mansion is worse than uh, the guy we're going to get. No, that's true, but, yeah. I, I was reminded over the weekend, uh, as other people are analyzing, well, why we didn't have this or this went wrong, but, you know, the mansion got in the way of a couple of bills that might have uh, made a, a difference, but, but, but because no one votes on policy, ultimately, probably not. Like, uh, there could have been some centerpiece legislation uh, that uh, might have played well in the newspapers, but since nobody was reading the newspapers and they were voting based on Joe Rogan, ultimately, I wish we had had that policy, but we probably would have lost, but had a policy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to come around on, on those guys, but I get what you're saying. There are definitely just some different give approaches them the out there. the room to act conservative. Watch what they do, not what they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, don't, uh, don't make them say it, too. They're going to lose if they do that. Maybe. Uh, although I do have some questions, like, for instance, uh, Glusen Camp Perez was the feature of, uh, of a couple of articles in which she's she, explaining She had this. things to say. Yeah. And now I'm wondering also, as uh, people are pointing out, that in many cases, down ballot was something of a underperformance disaster for Republicans in a lot of places, and that there were people who clearly came out. Some of these mystery voters that came out apparently came out and bullet voted for Trump and went home and didn't touch the rest of the ballot. And so I, I do have some questions about some of these, uh, you know, cloaked uh, Democrats who won in red districts, whether they... One, or whether Republicans who turned out to keep the district red by voting for Trump didn't bother to mark a ballot down lower, and so they survived. They weren't they weren't targeted and pushed out by, I'm going to vote red all the way down ticket. And I don't know how, I don't know what that does to their message of, this is the way you should follow me. But we, we don't have the numbers yet. Well, so again, we don't, yeah, we don't have all the numbers yet because the votes are still being counted. And that's why the presidential uh, popular vote uh, is going to be tighter this time mm -hmm. than it was in 2020, even though we lost. Uh, and, you know, this is another example of I have a thing to say. And so let me selectively look at the data, ignoring the parts that don't fit so I can give you the message yeah. I wanted to give you. Well, we are in that time and so since we're in that time uh again let's let's also the data couple, won't change other that. facts here's one from aaron <laughs> astor yes okay ice cold take the 2024 election was not really about trump or harris it was about the presidency of joe biden if he had higher approvals either mm. he or harris would have won but a party can't retain the white house if your president has 40 percent job job approval and then he uh well yeah then he gives the uh the vote in terms of how it went, strongly or somewhat approve uh, 40 percent, 96 percent of those voted for Biden, mm -hmm. strongly or somewhat disapprove, 82 percent of those voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. And that was 59 percent of the population. OK. Right. Yeah. So if if you're looking at Biden approval or disapproval as a, a predictor as to how you're going to vote, uh, 60 percent of the population were unhappy and they voted for Trump, 82 percent of them. So. That's that's how he won, you know, the yeah. many ways how he won. Again, this goes back to, uh, you know, people being unhappy about institutions and not willing to give the party in the White House any kind of break whatsoever in terms of where we're going from here. Another thing Astor adds is, seriously, it all came down to which theory of the electorate you wanted to believe because polls showed two possible outcomes. Oh, they showed a red wave or a blue wave. Basically, oh. were non-whites really going to shift this much? Turns out they did. That was the deciding factor. So, hmm. again, well, the deciding factor was Gen X. No, the deciding factor was non-whites in terms of how they broke, especially Latinos. No, the deciding vote was whether or not you disapproved or approved of Joe Biden. They're all mixed together. Hmm. There's no one thing. Uh, but they're, they're all important and they're all different factors. The people who had the least amount of trust in institutions turns out to be Gen X because Gen X doesn't like anything. And that's been true forever. 
I don't even like saying that. Yeah. So I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, I, it's funny because it's so baked We've in for me. That. Do I feel you know, we boomers? Everyone has said, said this. That. <laughs> we, we, we skipped over Gen X. Say. Now all of a sudden the millennials are important. We'll show you. I guess. I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting. Like, is there no like period during which everybody invites you to parties because your generation is cool? That doesn't happen. What well, are we, we know waiting for? for? A fact that that particular age cohort is the most conservative of the four. Yeah, we just don't know why. Well, they grew up under Reagan. Yeah, which things. to me means right. Do the opposite, but you'd think. Yeah. Well, they did the opposite of their parents. Okay. Yeah, they did do that. Oh well, we're a defiant group apparently. Yeah. You got to ask Michael J. Fox. You know that character he played on TV. Ah, I guess so. Yeah, you know, the liberal parents, Alex and you know, he was Keaton. the one with the the the, uh, the suitcase. Yeah. That he carried to work. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I remember the the the. Whatever you call it. I mean, I remember the show, certainly, and I remember uh, the, I don't know, the zeitgeist at the time where I was like, oh, you know, somehow retro conservatism, like, had this weird coolness to it because kids didn't know what else to do. And I guess because it appalled their parents. But, yeah, I don't know. That was an odd, was an odd time. And I would have thought... You could shed that now that uh, Reagan is long, long gone, and most people don't remember him. Well, those were uh, uh, general stuff. Uh, after the break, yeah. we'll talk about some more specific stories. Mm. Okay. I got Andy Kim. I got Chris Murphy. Hey. I got Radio ah. Free Tom. Tom oh. Nichols. He. And I got a random dude on Guardian. Oh, okay. Well, some of those random people are apparently the most important people, and they changed the outcome of the election. A lot of complaints about uh, that, too. I, I was trying to uh, do what uh, uh, what Glusenkamp Perez said I should do, but a guy said a bad thing about police. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio, and farewell to the Coldies Lozenge. Uh, the Coldies, our biggest new sponsor uh, in the form of uh, I pay them for a box of their lozenges, and then I talk about it. It took a half hour to dissolve that thing, so we'll see uh, whether it gets me through the rest of the show. Okay, so where were we? There was more news besides the lozenges. Uh, well, I, I wanted to go over a couple of stories here. They all sort of uh, link together here. Okay. This first one is interesting. It's in Politico magazine, and it's called An Overlooked and Increasingly Important Clue to How People Vote. Most Ooh, election postmortems it. neglect a key determinant of how people vote, where they get their news. Uh-huh. Okay. The exit polls and political analysis invariably focus on the changing behavior of demographic groups, Latinos, Gen X. That ignores a big determinant of political behavior. It's odd how little attention has been given to this, given that in the past decade, we've had a revolution in how information flows. We're bloggers. We know this. Nobody reads our blogs anymore. The exit polls did not ask about media consumption, so we need to look for indirect clues. NBC asked the question in April when Joe Biden was still in the race, and the results are dramatic. Among people who got their news from newspapers, Biden was winning 70 to 21. Mm -hmm. Among people who got their news from YouTube, Trump led fifty-five thirty-nine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, I, I'll, I will say one. I don't. I don't know. I don't know why they think it's overlooked, but you can say that in your headline. Uh, this is all anybody's been talking about, as far as I'm concerned. But 
Uh, since well, when? Si- I don't know. Since since forever. We've been talking about the you know the algorithm of YouTube being terrible uh, and bringing people yes. down the rabbit but, holes. But we and- haven't done, and what this article does a little bit is break down some interesting things about uh, gender, for example, oh, okay. and what we need more information. We were just talking about where do Latinos get their news. Okay. Uh, okay. And right. it says, these studies reveal an interesting fault line. While most women get their news from TikTok... Most young men get their news from YouTube or Reddit. Okay. And Twitter. Hmm. This is what Pew found. And that confirms that men and women often act on different sources of information. But while we spill many words analyzing whether New York Times headlines normalize bad behavior, we know very little about what news and information rises to the top on Reddit. That's probably true. true. I mean, I know Reddit for like, I need uh, uh, advice on how to play Diablo 4 season 6 because I'm a barbarian and it's not working. What do I do? Okay. That Reddit is very good for. for Good for news. If if that's your news. news, And I don't read it for the political stuff because I figure Reddit is probably like 4chan, only a little bit cleaned up and I don't want to go there. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, there's, there's reason to believe that your random weirdo might have a, a, a trick to help you with a video game less than uh, you might say, well, maybe random weirdos could tell me whether or not this stage of the appropriations process is uh, the appropriate place to uh, intervene with Senator so-and-so. Nah, probably not. They probably don't know there is such a Senator or what happens if there's a, uh, you know, a delay in the appointment at uh, the Bureau of... That I, wouldn't, that I would not go to Reddit for. Yeah, but the idea that males and females get different information oh, yeah. even on social media is uh, a bit of a new concept to me that I have to mull over. Hmm. I guess so. It is interesting, especially given the, the, the early excitement, I guess, about you know, well, no one can tell what you are and uh, who you are on, on the internet, and, and gender wouldn't matter nearly as much, but I yeah. guess it does. This Although is from the visual Guardian. medium, so. And yeah. it's a phone bank volunteer, somebody dear to our herd, okay. named Oliver Hall, and he says, and by the way, he looks like in his picture he's about 14, so therefore oh. uh, he's an expert. Cousin Oliver Hall. Yeah, well, but, no. probably knows more than the... Uh, uh, Grizzled veteran uh, politicos who lost the election. Let's turn to a guy I'd never heard of because yeah, sure. maybe he has something to say. So I spent hours trying to persuade U.S. voters to choose Harris, not Trump. I know why she lost. Oh. Wow. Oh. Why? I would uh, talk to small business owners who would talk about the price of gas or bread. Uh, and often they would just tell me everybody they knew was doing badly, even if they themselves were fine. It didn't seem obvious that poor messaging was to blame. Uh, the next group was extremely focused on Harris as a candidate, but there were too many others. Multiple times I was told that Harris was a communist, clueless. She had thrown <laughs> black men in jail Boy. for carrying a blunt. One Latin American voter told me at length she had seen it all before in South America. Oh, you know, and see right here in that headline is exactly why America's going downhill. Hmm. Right? They're calling them blunts and not doobies. <laughs> Is that the reason? All right. Well, anyway. please. Clear uh, this Harris up. perceived failures on border well, security different. Yeah. did come up too, but mainly the criticisms came straight from the mouth of the Trump campaign. Some spoke of Harris's tough stance on crime. Others, very often Latino origin, would tell me she was soft on law and order. Trump campaign no. successfully branded Harris as both a communist and too tough on crime at the same time. Communists are not soft on crime. But gender played a role. Time and time again, voters, very often women themselves, told me they just didn't think America's ready for a female president. Hmm. People said they couldn't see her in the chair and asked if I really thought a woman could run the country. One person memorably (laughs) told me she couldn't vote for Harris because you don't see women building skyscrapers. Uh, So... uh... Many Me conversations too, would start with positive hmm. discussions on policy and end up on Harris's gender. That's an extraordinary and uncomfortable truth. Yeah. And right. you should know what I didn't hear. Hours and hours and hours of speaking to U.S. voters. Nobody mentioned taxes on billionaires. Nobody mentioned Israel. Gaza came up hmm. only six times in more than a thousand calls. That's probably a good indicator of something. After all these conversations, I, mean, I think the main reason Harris and Walsh lost his campaign but... is simple. As Trump, he was simply too much of a pull. And despite the gaffes, despite his distaste for democracy, 
And despite an insurrection, <laughs> voters just didn't care, which I think is is true in uh, a larger sense. And I've seen this written by other people. One of the issues, and, and this is where uh, one of the, the uh, pointing fingers was at Biden when he was elected, is in trying to normalize the country, he didn't attack Trump hmm. for the things that Trump did wrong. So four years later, nobody remembers. And every time somebody would bring up a bad policy, somehow or other, it was, you know, a million people died of COVID. Well, that wasn't Trump's fault. Yeah. Well, according, you know, what they happened at the time, complete chaos. Well, that wasn't Trump's fault. Well, what about, you know, having the Taliban over for dinner on the anniversary of 9 11? Well, you know, Trump didn't do really that. <laughs> but, and if well, he did, it wasn't his I, fault. I, you know, so yeah. th- there was this willingness to just write off anything Trump did and, you know, really, you know, the Teflon Don all over again. Uh, but Harris got blamed for everything. Yes. You're the reason our institutions don't work. You're the reason we had inflation. You're the reason that uh, we didn't like Biden. And so, you know, it sunk her. But why? You know, uh, her gender probably has a lot to do with it, even though people don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it would be. Does, at this point, they're willing to talk about it. But Now they're willing to talk yeah. about it. Oh, gosh, are they willing to talk about it? They won't shut up about it. We're going to have to listen to it for four years. Well, they may be right. So I guess you should listen to that. But, yeah. Well, they, I, they are the MAGA people on the other side. Uh, yeah. Well, you got to listen. You, they, they, they cast those votes. I don't have, I'm not saying you have to go to a diner and listen right. to them. So Tom Just Nichols, know that right? they said it. That's all. Never Trumper. And remember, the Never Trumpers stuck with us. I said that they were going to do that. I was not worried about them at all. They were not the issue. All right. Uncharacteristically, I'll say, oh, by the way, another thing the guy didn't bring up, nobody complained that Harris was campaigning with Liz Cheney. Okay. That yeah, I, not I, the I don't reason think that would be on the list. Uh, yeah, no, they're, those guys don't answer the, the landline, certainly. Tom Nichols writes, so uncharacteristically, I'll say that Democrats should stop beating up on themselves and firing volleys back and forth. They can get back to that later. American voters are changing and they are becoming more like Trump and that's hard to counteract. Maybe the mistake we all made was thinking America would elect a black woman. I had a gut feeling they wouldn't. But in any case, when elections are about feelings, mm. fantasies, boredom and resentment, the candidate who services the delusions has a natural advantage. Now, Democrats are understandably vote, uh, focused on voters who flipped because they're suffering economically, but a far larger number of voters were unflippable and not poor. They're the comfortable Trumpers who think, like, Canada conspired in the shell Obama to hijack voting machines. These are the used car dealer owners that mm-hmm. we always talk about that live in Ohio and then move to Florida and then change the state. Uh, or are they, to the they may or may not have gone to college. A lot of them didn't. They're They're financially well off. Yeah. They think the country is falling apart, even though they themselves are fine. Mm-hmm. They certainly don't read, uh, and they don't read newspapers. And, uh, you know, this is the backbone of uh, the MAGA movement. So, you know, yes, the evangelicals, but the evangelicals couldn't get what they got without this other group here. Yeah. When millions of people think that way, Tom writes, you can't agonize too much over losing another three points during a global backlash against inflation that no government could have stopped. And the U.S. handled very well, especially when you've won important House and Senate races in all of the states where you lost the presidency. Yes. The Democrats should definitely have a reckoning about their inability to recognize that becoming a party of the college educated is a problem. But no Democrat can change the fact that millions of ungettable GOP votes are set in stone not because of economic conditions, which are the best any candidate could have hoped for, but because even relatively affluent voters have spent years marinating in complete craziness. And I'll add again, it's not some post-hoc rationalization. I wrote a couple of books about that. It's just, you know, it's the way it is. Okay. Andy Kim. Andy Kim weighs in. Andy Kim did fine in New Jersey. Interestingly, New Jersey also, like the rest of the country, moved to Republicans, but toward... Yeah. The northern part of New Jersey. Yes. Moved to the Republicans more they did. than the southern part of New Jersey. Yes. Uh, and, and yeah, and go part ahead. of it is media market. Yes, absolutely. Always the case in, in New Jersey. New Jersey doesn't have its own. It's split between New York and Philadelphia. 
So the northern part of New Jersey hears New York stuff, and there wasn't a lot of New York stuff because, like, it wasn't a swing state. Right. But the southern part of New Jersey heard all of the Philadelphia stuff, which is basically this is why Harris is good and Trump is bad. And so they did okay. In yeah. any case, uh, Andy Kim did fine. All right, good. And and said, and again, where Democrats fight, where Democrats resisted, uh, Democrats did better than in other places. So I'm not buying that. Oh, the more you hear Democrats, the more you dislike them. Actually, the opposite was true. Hmm. In 2020, Andy Kim writes, I was one of seven Democrats that won a district that Trump won. So I held a series of listening sessions with people who voted for Trump and voted for me to understand. I reread the transcripts yesterday and much of it felt like it could have been said today. And mm-hmm. so... He will. Uh, he will. He will read them again. Mm. OK. Across the board, conversations began with expressions of what I can only describe as a deep disgust in politics, distrust in politicians, distrust in the status quo. And this wasn't about the specifics, but deep seated long term dissatisfaction. And again, this is what we're talking about here. Distrust in the yeah. institutions with Democrats being the party of defend them. Even after four years in office, Trump wasn't seen as a status quo or politician. There was a clear belief Trump was different. Some raised real concerns about his policies, his personality, but they didn't override the disgust for politics. And when I read that, I thought, you know, that reminds me of Jesse Ventura. Hmm. Schwarzenegger, when he ran for governor of California. These are people who clearly weren't qualified, but it didn't yeah. matter. Right. It mattered not at all because people just didn't like the status quo and wanted to blow it up. Yeah. Well, it mattered not at all in a number of ways, including, well, now here's the guy you wanted uh, when you were so disgusted with politicians. How much different is your life? Not at all. Oh. Well, you know, I don't think that California or uh, Minnesota, is that where Jesse was? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Went for Trump. They knew better. No. Uh, that's, That's true. But yeah, I mean, just I'm, I'm wondering how many people were like, I was disgusted with politics and politicians. That's why I voted for Jesse Ventura for governor. These guys are so bad. And how bad could this next right. guy be? Now that explains things. My question is, if we go back to them and say, so now you have had it's years later. Jesse Ventura has come and gone, or Arnold Schwarzenegger has come and gone. How are you feeling about politics now that the guy that you voted for out yeah, of disgust? They politicians. Yeah, right. So I need so a guess guy. what. Yeah, maybe. And I don't love Trump. But maybe he's the only it's other you guy running. So you know, yeah, it's going to be him. Right. You could try to science them out of it, but they don't believe in science. Well, what's the constant yeah. here, sir? It's you. Now, Andy Kim says. Yeah. For these voters, they saw me, Andy Kim, as different. What stood out to me is their comments presented an opening for a different way to be different, and Trump's playbook isn't it. For ex- for instance. The 2020 crossover voters resonated with my heavy focus on reform and taking on corruption. They like that I don't accept corporate PAC funding. And and basically, in his case, he had the cachet of taking on the New Jersey machine and winning. Yeah. So if you hate politics and you hate the status quo and you think it's all rigged and then you have a guy who beat the system, yeah, you're going to like him. Yeah, probably. Is that transferable? No. Yeah. Because all remember, guys, all you have to do is go out there and beat the system. No, beat the New Jersey no. system. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that's true. And then it won't help you if you're in Minnesota. I beat the New Jersey system. Well, that's nice. Right. Different point of view from Connecticut, which, by the way, didn't go. It also went red, but not that much. I mean, uh, we apparently all everybody of our, trended all of our, uh, that way. Congress people won. Chris Murphy won. Uh, my district didn't change that Except much. Utah. I was very skeptical of an Emerson poll that said that Trump was going to win my district. He didn't. Okay. Uh, Johanna Hayes was only up by a point or two. She actually won by six. Oh. Um, so, you know, it was pretty subtle. Uh, Connecticut, land of steady habits. I Chris guess. Murphy writes, that was a cataclysm. Electoral map oh. wipeout. Senate Democrats' practical ceiling is now 52 seats, whereas Republicans can get as many as 62. In mm-hmm. any given year. Okay, you'll know. So it's time to rebuild the left. We're out of touch with the crisis of meaning and purpose. And that fuels MAGA. We refuse to pick big fights. Our tent is too small. So some early thoughts. The left has never fully grappled with the wreckage of 50 years of neoliberalism, which has left legions of Americans adrift as local places are hollowed out. Rapacious profit-seeking cannibalizes the common good and unchecked new technology separates and isolates us. The things that mattered are disappearing. We spend half as much time with friends. Hard work no longer guarantees economic mobility. 
The left skips past the way people are feeling, which is alone uh, and underwhelmed, or overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and underwhelmed with politics, overwhelmed with life, well, and straight to uninspiring solutions like uh, build back better. I get too little to actually upset the status quo of who has power and who doesn't, and that's the underlying issue. I guess, although I do have to say, I would, as an editor, I would say, this is a piece, or at least an, or a, uh, a paragraph you don't want to start with, Americans are disillusioned with decades of neoliberalism, just because I just went, what? Uh, I mean, I get, what, I understand what you're talking about, but that's, yeah, that, that'll that rally the diners. That needed well, to be reworded. Yeah, but you don't have to understand it to understand <laughs> that, that, like... You know, outsourcing all the jobs overseas was bad. Yeah, well, yeah, right. but you you could lead with that, or I don't know. I mean, it's a small criticism. I understand where he's going, and nobody's going to change the world with this article. So, okay, fine. But yeah, that, that, it seems to me like, well, yeah, you're, the voters you're looking to reach out to are going to say, oh, this is another one of those stupid politician articles that don't understand anything. They, Look at the size of this word, neoliberalism. Mass deportation is a terrible response to Americans' real sense they're helpless in the face of global forces like increased migration. But you can't ignore the pain where this comes from. We don't listen enough. We tell people what's good for them. And when progressives like Bernie aggressively go after the elites that hold people down, they're shunned as dangerous populists. Why? Maybe because true economic populism is actually bad for our high income base. And the Democratic Party now has a high income base. Okay. So, right. you know, there's there's a lot in this very complicated mix. Meanwhile, men tumble into a different kind of identity crisis as the patriarchy society's primary organizing paradigm for centuries crashes, and rightly so. The right pushes an alluring dial back. The left says get over it, a refusal to listen or offer responsible solutions. We can't be afraid of fights, but we have to pick big fights, not little ones. Okay. Alluring dial back. Mm. But here's the thing. No. You need to let people into the tent who aren't 100 percent on board with us in every social and cultural issue, issues like guns and crime, climate. Well, you know that. I've told you yes. that about the never Trumpers. Sure. Let them in. Stop arguing about the fact that Liz Cheney, do you know who her father was? I know. Yes. Let All right. Well, in. I understand that part. Yeah. Well, it applies to everybody. Oh, everybody who's willing to come in. Let them in. There's many who won't be willing. You don't have to worry about those folks. They'll take care of themselves. Okay. So listen to poor and rural people, men in crisis, don't decide for them what's best for them. Pick fights, build a big tent, be less judgmental, because little fixes aren't going to do it. Hmm. People Love thy policy. neighbor, feed the hungry. It's, a, it's an attractive message. Yeah, it is, actually. Yeah. You know? Uh, you know. There was a guy who was pushing <laughs> that like 2,000 years ago. Yeah, a little bit happened to him. Yeah. I don't know. Is he popular? Well, I don't know. He lost the next election. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. Uh, they chose well, Barabbas. There's that's true. He did lose the first time around. Well, if at first you don't succeed, if you have the chance, right? Right. Uh, so the only saving grace. This comes from Swin on uh, Blue Sky. And again, mm. uh, uh, for technical reasons, I have a lot of trouble getting Blue Sky information onto Daily Cause. It doesn't embed. It mm. doesn't even embed on uh, Skype, which is what David and I used to talk to each other. Ah. Uh, Swin says, you know, I'm not saying this to deny the extreme amount of damage they could do and have actively planned to do. Are they mm -hmm. going to, they being MAGA, are they going to try to shred the democratic order, which is different than will there ever be an election again? The answer is yes. Will they try to ethnically cleanse? Yes. Will Trump go after all kinds of enemies in blatantly authoritarian ways? Yes. As one of the focus groups says, you keep saying Trump's an authoritarian. What's an authoritarian? Mm. What's well, a neoliberal? Yeah. Well, he uh, well a neoliberal is anything you don't like. I know yeah, that. that's <laughs> that much. I, I that's all I ever figured out. Yeah, and uh, an authoritarian that guy, is a something, something. Guy. It's a dictator. Occasionally, you say something about Iraq or whatever. Okay. Will he and they return to their ungodly pornographic levels of corruption to the government? Ooh. Yes. Are they going to work to crack down on reproductive freedom? Oh yes. All yeah. I'm saying is I know many of those people personally, and I can say with direct perspective, they will soon, maybe very soon, start screwing this up so hard. They are uniquely craven. Many are dumber than dog shit, and their cruelty hey. is only matched by their ability to cower and faceplant. Okay. So that's the only saving grace. 
Uh, all right. <laughs> That's the only saving grace. But it's a big tent, so yeah. let him in. Well, <laughs> if they're willing to cast that vote, I guess. But, you know, go big, they're going to go big and screw up. Ah, okay. Well, I do think they are going to. And I know that uh, the, the, the new theme is this time either uh, – well – it's a re- I'm very reluctant to say Trump knows better uh, or even that he's got better people or people who are more willing to do his bidding. But th- they are extraordinarily oafish people and, and and they will be doing things for which there's no precedent, which might give them more freedom to do things, but will also give them more freedom and latitude to, to screw it up in ways that they could never have seen coming. So, right. yeah. There, I, I do think that they will still fall over their own feet and step on lots of rakes. Right. That's that's true. And then finally, in the couple of minutes we have, that's pretty much the roundup of oh, the look weekend. At that. A lot of this is uh, noting and, and waiting. Yes. Um, moving over from Twitter to Blue Sky. Oh, yeah. Big movement this weekend. Uh, so there was a lot of people that moved. Uh, I, I've. I've had an account on Blue Sky for a while now. Mm-hmm. I'm getting a little bit more active there. Again, it doesn't fit all my needs at Daily Coast because it doesn't uh, embed. But uh, skipping that for the moment, I just wanted to mention a concept which you may or may not be familiar with and our listeners who may be new users may not be familiar with. Mm-hmm. And that's something called a starter pack. Yes. A starter pack is somebody like, oh, let's take in this particular case, Anthony Michael Kreese, one of my uh, Georgia uh, legal professors I like to listen to, made a list of law professors, historians, and political scientists. And I think the starter packs uh, allow you to have like 150 names, no more. So the 151st, you got to start a new one. But in any case, hmm. you click on the starter pack. Yeah. And then there's a, a just a, a, a radio dial at the very top that says follow all. You hmm. click it. And now you're following 150 chosen law professors, historians, and political scientists. And now you have a list to read. Okay. And it just makes it easy. You could do sports. You could do gaming. You could do, you know, whatever it is you want. Uh, But if you find the starter pack, it just makes it a whole lot easier to start your list. Because you may have spent 10 years at Twitter, you know, uh, uh, creating your list that you want to follow. Yeah. And then you move over here and you don't know where everybody is. And so this is one easy way to do it. So. Yeah, Another thing that you could do is you could pull your followers from Twitter. There are, there are little apps for that. So you mm. can move over to Blue Sky and then just bring your followers with you. Yes. Um, or, or bring the people you follow with you. So there's all sorts of little uh, techno tools. Yeah, there's a lot of developers uh, putting those things together to make the transition easier than it has been yeah. to date. Embedding and dealing with images are still difficult, just so you know. Uh the other side of the coin, though, I think is really interesting. Caroline Orr and a bunch of other people have said this, uh, academics, as they stay on Twitter, and that is to say, I get the attraction of some place like Blue Sky, but there's two downsides that you should at least consider when you decide what to do, and they may not be determinative for you. But first of all, I hate the idea of giving it up to the Nazis, the old site. And secondly, uh, being in a bubble where everybody agrees with you is not all that useful. It is mm. if you're trying to find information, but I like if you want to monitor what's going on and what other people think, that's not the place for it. Mm. Yes. Well, some of the things that they're thinking should not be monitored. Maybe. It, you know, but you for that for reason, again, I'm yeah, going to okay. spend more time on Blue Sky, but I'm not closing my Twitter account. Yeah. That, I, you know, what are you going to do? For you got to do if these it gets things. Worse, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's getting to the point where it's driving some people crazy. Also, they're making technical changes at Twitter that many people did not like. There's that, uh, you know, they're apparently having something to do with blocking and what you can and can't prevent others from seeing, and they changed that, and that made a number of people mad. You can block them mad. so you don't see them, but you can't block them yes. from seeing you. Right. I don't really care. I've used my block list to the point where what I read on Twitter – uh, is what I want to see yeah. from the people I want to see it. Right. And well, I'm, I'm very quick with the block uh, buttons. I don't really care if they're reading me or not. That's, I don't yeah, not. Right. That's, that's for you. There are others who uh, experience different problems there and really do want that kind of protection and they find sure. this guy better. Absolutely. But, I totally understand right. what I'm saying. There yeah. will be a number of people that for the time being stay there. Oh, yeah. 
And, uh, you know, you can't you beat can get all up. the lectures in it's the world about why you fair. should leave. I'm just giving you two points of view as to why you should stay. Okay. Uh, I uh, also found out, I heard over the weekend, some interesting tools where people are leaving. They're very reluctant to leave behind a long record on Twitter and not be able to call it back up or use it or that, you know, they have information that they themselves posted that they wanted stored. There are a couple of uh, uh, apps, one of which is a paid app, but which claims to be able to uh, uh, basically download your Twitter history and then transfer it over to Blue Sky and will eventually repost everything with the original date as though it were originally posted on Blue Sky. I'm not certain how it works, but mm -hmm. that sounded interesting. Yep. And uh, even more uh, apps that are, many of which are free, which are, no, burn it all, uh, how to totally destroy your Twitter tracks, if that's what you want to do. So it's a very right. interesting side market. Well, you know, everybody's got to have a hobby. Yeah, and everybody has different needs and different things that they want to do with their Twitter accounts. Keep them, burn them, preserve them, lock them, hide them, whatever. So, uh, well, we live in weird times, and as it turns out, we're, you know, well, awaiting... Again, big Ten. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. Yeah, which you right. Need to. You're allowed to. If you want to lecture me about what I should do, oh, not well, that interested. Yeah, I mean... If the tent is big enough, you could go over in a corner where we don't hear you <laughs> and <laughs> lecture true. there and stay out of the rain. Or, you know, keep lecturing in the middle. I'll, I'll go over to that. Uh, other yeah, point. sure. You're very flexible. Okay. So, yeah, there's lots to do, but lots of people have different ideas about what they do and do want to not want to do about Twitter. And, and I guess there is now the legitimate concern that we have. We're going to be, you know, re-inaugurating a Twitter-addicted and very vindictive and personally petty president of the United States. And maybe people don't want to, you know, prominent people in particular, don't want their anti-Trump statements left there and don't want to... Don't want to give them reason to come after them. So lots of cleanup to be doing. Uh, thanks, Greg. We'll speak again on, on Wednesday. How about that? Yeah, we will. Yeah. Okay. An excellent idea. By then, this lozenge. We're not moving off of Skype. I'm not looking for a new platform. Ah. All right. Welcome back now to the Kid Growing the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So uh, we're into the what would be the, the third cold ease lozenge if I had continued on. They go about half an hour. We're going to measure time that way. No more Friedman units. It's, uh, it, but, but no, I don't need it. Now I, now I just need to hydrate. They dry you out pretty good. All right. So, well, golly, there's an awful lot to, to catch up on and, uh, I'm just going to have to run through it. The pocket is full of stories of any number of different angles on different things we've got to get through. Well, let me give you this by way of, I guess, brief pick me up. I imagine the situation for him is going to change. Uh, at some point, but uh, Rudy Giuliani is having a hard time about things, and that's good. Rudy Giuliani, it is said, we're not sure, it is said that he is too broke to buy food, he says, amid the defamation suit struggle in which he is engaged. As you know, he was ordered to uh, turn over his apartment in New York and a couple other pieces of property. Liam... Our Chucky, is that right, is the name of the reporter for the Daily Beast who covered this story. And, you know, we went through some of the drama of him hiding his assets. I doubt very much that he's too too broke to buy food. That's just what he's telling the court so that, he does, you know, they don't come down on him and try and uh, confiscate more things from him. But if he were, in fact, too broke to buy food, uh, as I noted when I saw this story on on Blue Sky yesterday. Uh, yes, I hear you. I understand. that That is not, I, I feel bad for you, but like, you're too poor to pry food. Okay, duly noted. And, you know, gee whiz. Anyway, the Trump ally, it says in the subheader here, begged for donations to help pay off the $148 million judgment from his election worker defamation lawsuit. So, there you have it. Oh, look, it's going to let me read the original this time. How nice. Thanks, Daily Beast. I wonder what made you change your mind. Rudy Giuliani has alleged that he doesn't have enough money to feed himself. So don't. 
After a federal judge ordered him to start paying the $148 million judgment he faces for defaming Georgia poll workers in the wake of the 2020 election. It's a nonsense claim, of course, because, you know, it's not that you, uh, uh, that every dollar of cash that enters your pocket is yanked away to pay off the judgment. They will allow you a certain, uh, allowances for, for food and necessary medical care, et cetera. They just, they don't want you to go to town and, uh, be dining at steakhouses every night. But uh, anyway, he's almost assuredly dying. Uh, I'm sorry, lying regardless. But he is also probably dying. So, I mean, there's there's no fighting that, right? Anyway, the former New York City mayor and close ally of President-elect Donald Trump took to X to whine about his fiscal woes. See, that probably cost him. He's probably paying for that check mark too. Let's sue him for that. And to beg followers to donate to his fundraising campaign. Willicky Farr Law Firm and Judge Lyman are trying to inhibit me from making a living, he wrote. No, they're not. They want you to make a living because that pays their clients. But all right. They seized my measly checking account so I can't buy food. Help me fight. The post linked to Giuliani's campaign hosted on Give, Send, Go, which is a Christian alternative to GoFundMe, because as you know, GoFundMe is uh, the uh, the spawn of Lucifer, apparently. You got to have a Christian alternative to GoFundMe. What, and by the way, what is a Christian alternative to GoFundMe? At GoFundMe, you raise money, and GoFundMe takes, I don't know what, 1%, 5% of the, uh, of the, the take for... The processing fee, that's how they make their money. A Christian alternative to GoFundMe uh, passes a collection plate and takes 10% of, (laughs) uh, uh, it tithes your, I don't know, maybe it should. That would be kind of a funny thing, actually. I would support that. At any rate, a Christian alternative to GoFundMe, not sure why you even need one, but it's favored by white nationalists. Ah, yes, that's why you need one. It's not that it's Christian Per se, that, that's the disguise. I guess that's probably the best way to describe it. Uh, give, send, go is where you go when you have been banned from GoFundMe because you're a white supremacist Nazi. And so they started give, send, go. And then people were like, so I don't understand. Give, send, go is for Nazis. Uh, and they said, no, Christians. Oh, well, that's better than Nazis. I guess it's OK then. So that's where you go. But the Daily Beast kind of gives you the lowdown there. GoFundMe's, uh, it's a GoFundMe alternative favored by white nationalists. Wink, they say Christians. Giuliani, in about a half a day, had raised nearly $100,000 and received over 250, quote, prayers, which I guess is like uh, when you repost a message on Twitter, you say you've retweeted it. And I guess on Go fund me. When you give them money, you quote unquote give them money. On the Christian alternative, you quote unquote pray for them in the form of two hundred and fifty dollar donations. Anyway, America's mayor Rudy Giuliani has been persecuted to the highest level through lawfare due to his support of President Donald Trump. The campaign's description reads: Therefore, we are raising funds to go directly to his legal defense. Well, the defense is over. He lost. The money that's raised can, of course, be garnished for uh, payoffs of the of the judgment, which is fine, given that he said he was trying to raise money to help pay off the judgment. So I don't know. I'm not certain how he puts it on the campaign page, but uh, that's the situation he finds himself in. Giuliani has so far failed to pay up on the eye popping figure that he owes to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss because he can't. The mother-daughter Georgia ballot-counting duo who sued Trump's former attorney for falsely accusing them of election fraud. On Thursday, U.S. District Judge Louis uh, Lyman, I guess it's Lyman, eh? L-I-M-A-N, scolded Giuliani and gave him a week to hand over the valuable property that he still owns. Uh, And by the way, that's even, who cares, right? I mean, remember what he actually did was... He was supposed to hand over his New York apartment and all the furnishings and lots of, you know, like souvenirs and sports memorabilia and stuff that had tremendous amount of value. Plus, apparently a Mercedes 
uh, convertible that he owned. And not only did he not hand over any of that stuff, he moved it out of the apartment so that it wasn't available for them to seize and then showed up at the polling station to vote on Tuesday in that Mercedes in front of everybody. So, you know, to say that the judge well, scolded him and gave him a week, like, how about hit him on the head with your gavel and throw him down the stairs? You know? You know, it used to be we don't do things like that in this country, but I'm making America great again. So anyway, although he turned over his access, access to his Manhattan apartment, Giuliani is on the hook for a list of luxury items that includes a signed Joe DiMaggio jersey, watches given to Giuliani by European leaders after 9-11, and a vintage Mercedes once owned by the actress Lauren Bacall, among other assets. That is an odd throwback, but okay. And that's the one I guess he's tooling around in and uh, thumbing his nose at everybody. Uh, of particular contention are four Yankees World Series rings that Freeman and Moss laid claim to as fulfillment to the judgment. When they tried to collect the rings, Giuliani said he had given them to his son Andrew as a gift because he knew that they were going to be taken otherwise. On Saturday, though, the judge ruled that the attorneys for Freeman and Moss could serve a subpoena on Giuliani's accounting firm to review his tax returns in an effort to verify whether Giuliani was telling the truth about that gift. The rings are estimated to be worth about $200,000. So that's where he is. He says he can't eat. I say he shouldn't. And that's fine. Uh, I just thought, I don't know. I thought you might find that interesting. Let's see. Other things to share with you. Oh, some of them are in... Uh, on blue sky and as you know they don't translate all that well uh yeah okay we're gonna have to read this thing too this uh i got this uh thread on what do you call it blue sky right so thinking back to uh the threads and the thread reader on on twitter and uh greg saying that the blue sky stuff doesn't embed and i just i did see a note earlier from scott that I'm sure you've figured this one out too, Greg, but uh, things from threads apparently seem to embed pretty well on the website. But I also have seen with the big migration to Blue Sky over the weekend, lots of people saying that they've tried lots of the alternatives to Twitter and they're finding that, hey, threads actually kind of sucks and Blue Sky is a little bit closer to the Twitter experience that they were looking for. So... There they are. And Threads has had some weird wrangling with the way its algorithm works and the way it handles news. And there's been some very odd things. I've never given Threads a try myself. But anyway, I have uh, both this thread and Threads are being uh, improved upon, I think. Also, I understand on Blue Sky. Um and it's a little confusing when one of the other competitors is named Threads. But on Blue Sky, I guess the ability to thread comments and link them one to the other was somehow less robust than it was on Twitter, although it seemed to work just fine here from my experience. But I guess occasionally you lose those links and it just doesn't work the same way that it did on Twitter. But apparently not only is that being improved by the developers, but I saw an announcement that they came up with a, uh, a um, I don't know what, a feature that uh, sounds like it makes good sense, should probably should have been implemented on Twitter a long time ago, that allows you to compose an entire thread all at once before posting any of it. Like a lot of times, if you don't know how long it's going to take you to, to talk about something, uh, you know, and you see these threads that were numbered on Twitter back in the day, you post one of ten uh, I mean, people figured out ways to compose them ahead of time, maybe in a word processor where they counted up the characters and broke it up into different pieces so they could tell you there's going to be 10. But very often you would see, you know, uh, tweet one of question mark. I don't know how long this thing is going to go on, whatever. But now you can compose the whole thing all at once and release it in sequence and have it stay connected. That's apparently a, a very big plus to people on Blue Sky. So anyway, that has nothing to do with what I was going to tell you about next, which is, uh, except for the fact that one of the sources for this story is comes via a Blue Sky thread and the other from The Guardian. The Guardian 
I saw first. Let's read you what's going on. I hinted at it uh, when we were speaking with Greg. And uh, the first, I am sure, in a series of moves by Trump to just, you know, push aside the roadblocks that are inconvenient, but in the Constitution. Uh, it is in The Guardian. It is Luca Itimani who has written this piece. I don't believe we've called that name before. An explainer, it's labeled, of the U.S. elections. Uh, U.S. presidential election updates. Trump demands Senate streamline his cabinet picks as recruitment begins. It's interesting to get this perspective from a uh, newspaper from abroad. Uh, so we'll begin here. Rick Scott as we mentioned, has emerged as front runner for the role of Senate Majority Leader as Trump urges Putin not to escalate the war in Ukraine. That's interesting to see whether he'll be able to deliver on that. Trump uh, promised that uh, the war in Ukraine would never have happened if he were president, even though the war was ongoing when he became president and stayed ongoing while he was president. It escalated shortly after he left the presidency, But the idea that it would never have happened seems dumb, given that it was happening when he was the president. But it doesn't matter. Facts don't matter. Stop looking for logic. So this story, President-elect Donald Trump has demanded the incoming Republican leader in the Senate streamline the temporary approval of his cabinet appointees as his team begins assembling the incoming White House team. Three Republicans are vying to replace incumbent Majority Leader Mitch McConnell ahead of a party vote on Wednesday. Senator Rick Scott of Florida has earned endorsements from Trump's MAGA camp, including from Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Elon Musk, and Marco Rubio, each of whom has been speculated to be among Trump's top team. Marco Rubio? That seems like an interesting interpretation of things. We'll see whether that sticks. Any Republican senator seeking the coveted leadership, all capitals. This is, oh, this is Trump. Uh, he may have been using Twitter on this one rather than, I mean, he may have just put it on both Twitter and Truth Social. But I'm pretty sure I saw this come under the uh, account of his, his, his Twitter account, his X account, Real Donald Trump. You remember the old one, uh, the one that got suspended for insurrection and then got put back when Elon Musk bought Twitter. Any Republican senator seeking the coveted leadership position in the United States Senate must agree to recess appointments. He's capitalized the two words, recess appointments. Um, And it's not entirely clear whether he means recess appointments or not. It's tough to tell with him. Anyway, uh, this is what he posted, uh, referring to a controversial measure, as they put it, that would put his cabinet picks in office while temporarily sidestepping a lengthy Senate confirmation process. And it's not entirely clear that he's what he means, because he's just using terminology that that doesn't really apply. Recess appointments. Uh, Recess appointments are, of course, when a president appoints someone to a Senate confirmable position, but the Senate is in recess. There's a doctrine that based on the old system, wherein a Senate recess could last a considerable amount of time back in the horse and buggy days, when a Senate recess meant it might take a month or two to reconvene, to bring the, the senators back from, distant lands by horse, uh, they allowed for uh, at least temporary occupation by uh, the appointees, you know, and there were whole rules for it. And uh, a recess appointment would last until the end of the session of Congress following the one during which the appointment had been made. So it was like good for a year, year and a half in general, something like that. And then afterwards, that person could continue in office if they were then confirmed by the Senate. But these days, the Senate doesn't recess in the same way or for nearly as long. And it does, you know, it's not a matter of, well, if it was an emergency and you had to confirm a new secretary back in the day, secretary of war, you need a new secretary of defense now, and it's an emergency. 
Uh, and it could be a month before they are able to reconvene the Senate. They would just say, no, an emergency. We're going to bring the Senate back. They'll be here tomorrow. Don't worry about it. And they'll confirm them. It's not a big deal. But then it became used as a as a workaround, right? If the Senate would go on recess for a weekend, you know, I'll appoint the person over the weekend and then say, it's a Senate's out of session, so they're automatically in for a year and a half. And Senates and how the House and Senate used to begin to work together to adjourn rather than recess so that there wouldn't be the recess for appointments like that in order to prevent presidents from doing it. But that was back when presidents followed rules and worried about what courts would say. So I'm not certain that applies in this situation. But I I can't tell whether he is saying, I want to be able to appoint people uh, starting on, well, starting right away, and they can start serving in my administration even before I'm inaugurated or before you're sworn into Congress or just whenever I feel like it. I, there's no, like, a recess appointment. What recess are we talking about? Trump isn't legally entitled to make appointments until January 20th. And typically speaking, I don't know. I mean, maybe the first co- in uh, between January 20th and, you know, February, end of February, they'll go on a recess for a long weekend once or twice, but there's not much. I don't know. So maybe he's anticipating uh, what will happen after January 20th. But in, this makes it sound like he wants to start doing things now. And recess appointments is just not the right terminology. But they're going to sane wash this thing into making it a, a, a more coherent demand. The problem is that the, it's coherent it, or it can hang together as a theory. It's just totally insane and not based in anything constitutional whatsoever. And they just sort of skip that part. So where are we? Uh, he's demands that any Republican senator seeking the coveted leadership position in the U.S. Senate must agree to recess appointments and then goes on. The president-elect also announced that he was bringing back hardline immigration official Tom Homan, H-O-M-A-N, to oversee the country's borders and deportation efforts in the coming administration, labeling Homan the border czar. So it's not clear, entirely clear what office he would be appointed to, but it would give him jurisdiction over border issues. Homan, of course, you know, a huge fan and a huge proponent of mass deportations and camps, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, is he the one that was uh, quoted with the, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet kind of thing? You know, just exactly the most dangerous and infuriating guy that you didn't want to be anywhere near this policy, but who will now take over this policy on behalf of Trump. Um, But he... Like, uh, I guess we should also point out Elon Musk and a couple other people who have been said to be on tap for special roles, RFK Jr., in the administration. Uh, It's not entirely clear that they would be appointed to existing cabinet positions. They would instead be made a czar of something, which was a huge mistake to even ever use that terminology from way back when whenever we started doing it. But now, uh, I guess Trump thinks, and maybe he's right, that he can just sort of say, well, I'm just creating ad hoc positions, and they're called czars, and basically they do whatever they want because whatever I want to take from them, I'll take from them, and whatever I want to ignore, I'll ignore. And uh, you don't need to approve uh, in the Senate whether or not a czar takes over anything because it's not a thing. So let's just do things that way. And then there'll be no legislatures, no legislative check on the president's power to appoint anyone or to appoint advisors uh, or people to run the cabinet positions for that matter. So let's see. He's going to call him the border czar, but not say what position he's going to take. Trump is meeting with potential candidates to serve in his administration and has charged his longtime friend Howard Lutnick with recruiting officials who will deliver rather than dilute his agenda. Here's what else happened on Sunday and the rest of it, I mean, is not quite relevant to this story. But just so we can get the rundown on all these things, there's probably other stories that we need to catch up on and miss. So let's touch on them. Let's see. I'll give you the the top lines on the bullet points here. Trump spoke with Vladimir Putin on Thursday and advised him not to escalate the war in Ukraine. The 
top line on that so far has been apparently he brought Elon Musk with him on the call. So, you know, n- uh, people who were worried about his interference in matters of national security, I guess maybe maybe some people thought that was an over the top ap- accusation, but I guess it's no longer the case. It's over the top. If you have enough money, you can come and listen in on calls like that between uh oh, uh, this was a discussion with Putin, I'm sorry. That was with Vladimir Zelensky. When Trump got set up on a call that he brought Elon Musk with him. Uh, no, I guess nobody was on the call with him with uh, Putin. Other, I, um, so I, I forgot. I'm, I misread that one. Other uh, bullet points. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he had a good and very important conversation with Trump. And that was undoubtedly about uh, building condo towers in Gaza. Where's, uh, let's see, Republicans on Sunday appeared close to clinching control of the U.S. House of Representatives as well. Still a couple of outstanding races there. And I think it's down to like six or seven races, which Democrats would have to win every single one of in order to have any chance and then even st- of, of having a majority. And I guess they still have a path to 218 exactly, but I'm not positive of that any longer. Um what else? A Bitcoin soared to a record new high. Hooray. Uh, Trump's talk of revoking broadcast licenses and jailing journalists could undermine press freedom, they note. That's uh, thanks for that one. Some companies have been moving factories from China to other places in Southeast Asia in anticipation of uh, possible uh, uh, tariffs against Chinese imports. There'll be tariffs for all imports, apparently, under the Trump plan, but tariffs against imports from China, apparently among the highest he has planned. And so, uh, of course, he ran on the idea that that would bring those jobs back to the United States, but instead, it seems that they will send them to other parts of Southeast Asia instead. All right. So, anyway, we acknowledge that all these things are going on. Now I wanted to jump back into Pocket and then back over to Blue Sky to talk more about this idea, if it is an idea, that Trump has about how he can fill jobs in his administration and his cabinet. Uh, The tweet thread that I have is from one Anil Kalan, K-A-L-H-A-N, and Anil is A N I L, but he's uh, his handle here is A Kalan A K A L H A N at Blue Sky dot social, and he writes. Uh, let's take a look at his profile so we can figure out who he's a law professor at Drexel University, for instance. That should tell you a pretty good. That's a pretty good starting place for figuring out what's going on here. He writes autocratic legislative process colon and then a quote. Complaining that Senate approval takes too long, Trump said anyone seeking the leadership position of the United States Senate must agree to recess appointments, parenthetically he adds, in the Senate, a tactic that would effectively allow him to place any person in his cabinet without formal Senate approval. Now this comes uh, with an attached article, this time from the independent.com. Now, notice, I, I mean, I'm sure this is covered in the New York Times and Washington Post. I just, for some reason, haven't seen people sharing that. Maybe it hasn't been covered. But interestingly, uh, I, I, I guess the British newspapers must think it's really hilarious to see the Americans undo their own revolution this way. And maybe that's why they're covering it. I don't know. At any rate, I guess I should read the rest of the thread before diving into the articles that are here and just see how he describes things. But it's very interesting. And uh, yeah, now this gets at the bigger problem. Not only is it that he might not be talking about just recess appointments, he might just be talking about, I don't ever want my cabinet picks and other appointments, advisory appointments, scrutinized by the Senate. And I think... Professor Kalhan here gets around to it in his thread, but what you should understand this to mean is he doesn't want to see there be any any up or down vote on can the notorious spy Mike Flynn 
join my administration in some official capacity. Can he now be my national security advisor, despite the fact that he was exposed as a gigantic security risk last time, and then went on to become a crazy-ass conspiracy nut that shouldn't have his hands anywhere near levers of power? Well... That all being the case, uh, he would like to do that anyway. The rest of the thread, well, let me read you the next installment, and then we'll take our last break here. Anil Khan, uh, Kalhan continues, Scott, Cornyn, and Thune all hint that they might be on board with surrendering the Senate's constitutional advice and consent responsibility. And there is a screen grab here of uh, the three of them basically saying, yeah, sure, we'll do it, no big deal. Oh, no. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction, and whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the k in the morning show here on netroots radio let's continue here i was reading the thread from professor anil kalhan of drexel university law professor at drexel who uh writes a thread with some notes and some links about this idea of uh, Trump making a demand that whoever takes the uh, or whoever is even running for Republican Senate majority leader must accept that uh, he demands, I don't know, the ability to make recess appointments. Is, but then you have to interpret, well, what does he mean by recess appointments? Maybe he means even appointments without any Senate review, even when the Senate is in session. Not really sure. Uh, what were the reactions? According to this screen grab here, and I don't really know where it's from, but maybe looks like it might be, I don't know, Politico or something. It doesn't really matter what the source is. The fact is it's here. It says Texas Senator John Cornyn agreed Trump has the power to do so and urged senators to get Trump's cabinet chosen quickly. South Dakota Senator John Thune said recess appointments were an option, quote, on the table. He's supposedly the institutionalist here. Florida Senator Rick Scott Backed Trump, quote, 100 percent. So you tell me which one Donald Trump is going to back in this contest. Uh, All right. Let's see. Next thread uh, entry here. He is quoting from Steve Vladek is Professor Calhoun. Vladek says, so long as the Senate majority leader is willing to move an adjournment motion and so long as a majority of the Senate is willing to vote in favor Nothing would stop this transparent end run around the Senate from succeeding. And I guess this is a link to his, uh, is this Vladek's Substack discussion about it? Uh, I guess so. Yes. Uh, and perhaps we'll take a look at that one because Steve Vladek is always worth checking in with as well. And I guess he's still quoting from that uh, in the rest of this thread and yeah i'm looking back down and uh the thread uh it continues to quote from vladek which probably to me means we should read a little bit of vladek but then ends with a citation to a columbia law review article 
which I am sus- I suspect perhaps uh, no. I thought it might be something that Professor Calhoun had written, but apparently not. It is instead a piece called Actings from Anne Joseph O'Connell. And the, the reference here is a flashback to Trump saying that he has expressed a deep affection for his non-confirmed agency leaders back in his first administration. He calls part of his leadership team my actings. As he once explained to reporters, I have acting and then sick. You know, I have acting just as a, let's turn it in. Let's make it into a music. I have acting and my actings are doing really great. I sort of like acting. It gives me more flexibility. And you remember what that was all about was that he simply, uh, when he realized he wasn't going to get cooperation on recess appointments, he just said, all right, well, you're just acting secretary. And, you know, you do whatever I tell you and run the place the way I tell you to run it until the Senate says yay or nay on making you the actual secretary. And if they say nay, then I don't appoint anybody, but you stay the acting. And he just, it was another way of end running around advice and consent. So, at any rate, let's see. There was first the um, uh, reference. First reference was to the Independence article. Trump demands next Senate leader allow him to bypass approval for cabinet appointments. That just claims that it's in, entirely bypassing advice and consent. Let's see if they have any further basis for that or whether it's just they don't give him the benefit of the doubt and sane wash the uh, recess appointments thing. Uh Ariana Bayo is the reporter for this one. Donald Trump called on Republican senators vying for the majority leader position to permit him to appoint temporary cabinet members without Senate approval through recess appointments and demanded that they reject any judicial nominations until he takes office. Ah, another aspect of this. If Democrats, Joe Biden and Democrats attempt to finish filling judicial vacancies that they've already been working on, or even if they start new ones, You must vote against them and prohibit them from happening. I don't know what kind of power they have to do it, but the clock will take care of most of that blocking, I'm sure. Complaining that Senate approval takes too long, Trump said anyone seeking the leadership position must agree to recess appointments in the Senate on Truth Social on Sunday. Oh, he used Truth Social for that. A tactic that would effectively allow him to place any person in his cabinet without formal Senate approval. Sometimes the votes can take two years or more. This is what they did four years ago. We cannot let it happen again. We need positions filled immediately, Trump wrote. Hours after this Trump statement, three senators running for the leadership position endorsed Trump's idea. Okay, so that quote that I thought might be from Politico is actually from this article. Uh, The framers of the Constitution, which I'm sure is a big chuckle over in the U.K., explicitly created checks and balances to prevent one branch of government from obtaining too much power. One way they did so was by directing the Senate to approve the president's nominations. Recess appointments are a provision that allows the president to appoint a cabinet position for a maximum of two years without the Senate's approval when the chamber is out of session. Its original intent was to be used when the Senate was in recess for long periods of time. These are fairly uncommon, and the last time a president used a recess appointment... In 2012, under former President Barack Obama, the Supreme Court ruled that they could not be made while Congress was in pro forma sessions. This made recess appointments effectively unusable. So, yeah, the effect of it is going to be, oh, a Democrat wanted to use uh, recess appointments. They are now illegal. You can't do them. Oh, a Republican wants to use them. They're now mandatory. That's that's what we're going to get. These are fairly uncommon, right, as we said, but now the last time was 2012, and the Supreme Court stepped in last time it was tried and made them effectively unusable, but they're going to do the opposite this time. Both Trump and President Joe Biden were unable to use recess appointments because the Senate uses pro forma sessions routinely. Those are short sessions typically held during recess periods that ensure Congress is technically in session, so that you can't make recess appointments. That's what they're built for, or at least... uh In modern usage, the pro forma session. In 2020, Trump threatened to use recess appointments by forcing Congress to adjourn. However, that never occurred. 
Throughout his first term, Trump memorably had a difficult time holding on to a full and consistent cabinet. It took him longer to fill his cabinet when he entered the office, in part because his transition team was seemingly unprepared, but also because Democratic senators hampered several nominees from being confirmed. This time around, Trump is more prepared, and some of the names floating around for cabinet positions are already stirring controversy. In his Truth Social post, Trump also asked that the Senate block any judicial nominations until he takes office because the Democrats are looking to ram through their judges. Trump appointed nearly uh, approximately 220 judges while he was president, a tactic that helped reshape the federal judiciary and assistant assist Republicans in pursuing litigation. Biden has invoked similar tactic, appointing 213. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it, too. He adopted a similar tactic. You mean doing judicial appointments? Trump in four years did 220. Biden in four years did 213. I mean, a similar tactic. Well, all right, whatever. I mean, I, I think that's... A weird way of putting it, and maybe a little bit of both sides But anyway, it's unlikely Trump's request will materialize as Democrats have control of the Senate until the end of the year. Uh, so, anyway, that adds the judicial appointments angle here. But now, what about, I'm curious about seeing what Steve Vladek had to say over at his Substack. Recess appointments and the, uh, recess appointments and slash in the Supreme Court, that is to say, recess appointments and the Supreme Court, how they handle them, and recess appointments in the Supreme Court. Hmm. To the Supreme Court? No, in the Supreme Court? All right, let's see what he means. President-elect Trump is already proposing to bypass a Republican-controlled Senate, Republican-controlled Senate, to install many of his nominees. But could he also do that to fill a seat on the Supreme Court? Yes, albeit briefly. And it's also really a yes slash no. Okay, I was wondering about that. So, yes, recess appointments to the Supreme Court. Has it ever happened? Yes, it has. Have there been, has there been controversy over it? Yes. Uh, one of the problems with it for judicial appointments in general, let alone the Supreme Court, is how long is an appointment to the federal bench? Lifetime appointment to the federal bench. An Article Three judge is appointed you know, during good behavior, which has been interpreted to mean lifetime appointment, wherever they are. They don't all stay, but lifetime appointment. On Supreme Court, they tend to stay, right? But problem, recess appointment. How does it, how long does it last? Up to two years, I say, you know, a year to a year and a half in general. What it, Again, you measure the time from the, uh, it's up to the end of the next session, usually about a year, you know, each Congress is two years long. It's divided into two sessions. So if you appoint, do a recess appointment right away in January for some reason, it would be valid for up until the end of the second session of this new Congress, which basically means all the way to the end of uh, 2026, right? So, uh that's, you know, however long you want, however you, you measure it, it's two years or so maximum, right? What's the difference between that and a lifetime appointment? Uh, all the rest of that person's life is the difference. Is If a Article Three judge is one that's defined as somebody who occupies a lifetime appointment on the bench... And you're looking at a person who occupies a two-year appointment to the bench. Is that person an Article Three judge or are they not? Well, the answer now, of course, is it depends. Did Donald Trump appoint them? Yes. Then they're an Article Three judge and whatever they say goes. Uh, of course, I guess at some point, suppose one of his judges inside of the two years goes crazy and rules in favor of Democrats. Then the answer is no, that guy's ruling doesn't matter because he's not a real Article Three judge. We're throwing him out. You can see where this is going. All right, so let's see. Here's what Steve Vladek has to say about this. Uh, welcome back, as he says, to One First. That's the name of his substack. And today, November 11th, 2024, marks our second birthday. Congratulations to you, I guess. And although he'll have more to say about the past and future of the newsletter, da, 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 I just want to say off the top how grateful I am to all of you. Okay, this is introductory language. You don't, you can go in here if you're a big Steve Vladek fan. I am, but it's a, you know, subscription pitch. 
by all means, go ahead. Every Monday, as he's explaining here, uh, including federal holidays like this one, I'll be offering an update on the goings-on at the court, uh, a longer introduction. To, all right, where can we get down? I was originally planning to spend this week's issue looking at how, to ch- how the change in administration may slash will affect the shape of the Supreme Court's docket during its current term. But yesterday, President-elect Trump floated the possibility that he will use a recess appointments clause to bypass Senate confirmation for many of his nominees, insisting on social media that whoever seeks leadership positions in the Senate support such a move. Elon Musk also tweeted that, without recess appointments, it will take two years or more to confirm the new administration. Leaving aside the remarkably crass politics of such a move, and of a senator who would so quickly yield the Senate's most important constitutional responsibility, In the name of leading a thus marginalized body, it seems worth diving a bit deeper into exactly what the Supreme Court has said about such a move. Alas, it's almost certainly constitutional. And the harder question of whether Trump could use a similar end run to install new justices if and when a vacancy arises. Yes, but not for long, is his answer. If nothing else, we're already seeing just how much a second term President Trump will transcend even those few political norms that have constrained him during his first term. But first, the court related news. Oh, okay. So now he's going to give you his on the docket roundup of what's going on in the Supreme Court. And as important as it is, I think I'll skip over it and get down to this information here. The one first long read, recess appointments in the Supreme Court. Oh boy, a long read. Let's do it. Although the Constitution gives the power to appoint most government officers, especially principal officers, to the president, it demands a role for the Senate in confirming the president's nominees, at least largely as a check on the president's ability to use the appointment power for cronyism, corruption, or to otherwise choose unworthy office holders. Ooh, I wonder if he's going to do that. For obvious reasons. The Senate's advice and consent is harder to come by when the Senate is controlled by the party opposite that of the sitting president. But even when the same party controls Congress's smaller chamber and the White House, there is a long history of the Senate asserting itself against at least some of the president's more controversial and or unqualified nominees, including during then President Trump's first term. Indeed, the reluctance of some Senate Republicans to sign off on Trump's more extreme nominees is a big reason why Trump spent so much of his first term relying upon, and in some cases abusing, the power to name acting officers under the Federal Vacancies Reform Act of 1998. Given that, no matter what happens in Pennsylvania, Trump is going to have a larger majority in the Senate come January 20th than he had at any point in his first term, It's worth asking what it says about nominees who are too extreme and or unqualified for even that Senate to confirm. But there's another way for the president to appoint officers, the recess appointments clause of Article 2. Per that provision, the president shall have the power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. Okay. That's the the language of it. And by the way, it probably could and should have been interpreted. Well, if there's a recess that happens or a vacancy that happens during the recess, that's one thing. But if there's a vacancy before the recess and then they recess, I mean, it's still happening during the recess, but I think it should probably originate during the recess. But anyway, nobody interprets it that way. Unlike acting office holders, where there are both formal and informal ways which they have less power than confirmed officers, individuals who receive recess appointments hold the office in exactly the same manner as if they had been confirmed by the Senate, albeit only until the expiration of the Senate's next session, which, absent some unforeseen development, would be no later than January 3rd, 2027. The original reason for the recess appointment clause is understandable enough, At the founding and up until World War II, Congress was a part-time concern, and the Senate was out of session at least as much as it was in session. The 6th Congress, back in 1799, for instance, was in session only from December 2nd, 1799 to May 14th, 1800, and then again from November 17th, 1800 to March 3rd, 1801. 
even as late as the 74th Congress, which sat from 1935 to 1937. The Senate was in session from January 3rd to August 26th in 1935, and from January 3rd to June 20th in 1936. Thus, the president needed the power to fill executive and even judicial offices when the Senate was out of session, with the constraint that those officers would hold their office only until the Senate had returned and concluded its business. Of course, now that Congress is effectively a year-round operation, the recess appointments clause has become all but anachronistic. The last time either chamber adjourned before mid-December was 2002. The Senate instead began using pro forma sessions in the mid-2000s, at least partly to prevent President George W. Bush from making recess appointments. In the early 2010s, President Obama nevertheless sought to make such appointments, only to be rebuffed by the Supreme Court. What do you know? In its 2014 ruling in Noel Canning v. NLRB, the court held that pro forma sessions of the Senate are still sessions for constitutional purposes and not recesses, but it also accepted the Justice Department's argument that a recess for purposes of the Recess Appointments Clause can occur during a session of Congress and not just in between them. Thus, under Noel Canning, so long as the Senate recesses for at least 10 days, then the President may use the Recess Appointments Clause to fill vacancies, whether those vacancies arose during that recess or earlier. And although there was no argument in Noel Canning that the Senate had adjourned for the purpose of enabling the President's resort to the Recess Appointments Clause, indeed, I'm unaware of any example historically in which that's why the Senate recessed. I can't see how that would matter. Adjournment is adjournment, regardless of the reason why the Senate is doing it. There ought to be political consequences for the Senate so meekly surrendering one of its critical constitutional checks on the executive branch, but I'm not sure, at least under Noel Canning, that there can be constitutional consequences. To be sure, some have suggested that this recess, so that Trump can appoint whoever he wants maneuver, would be subject to the filibuster. But... My own understanding of Senate rules is to the contrary. Motions to adjourn are not debatable and thus not subject to cloture. That sounds right. The only other constitutional requirement is the mandate in Article 1, Section 5, that the House consent to a recess that's longer than three days. But even if it doesn't, Article 2, Section 3 authorizes the President, in cases of disagreement between the House and the Senate with respect to the time of adjournment, to adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. Oh, dear. Thus, even if the House didn't acquiesce, the President could resolve the disagreement over adjournment unilaterally. In other words, so long as the Senate Majority Leader is willing to move an adjournment motion, and so long as a majority of the Senate is willing to vote in favor of that motion, nothing would stop this transparent end run around the Senate from succeeding. Indeed, it is possible that there are at least some senators who might balk at voting to confirm particular nominees who would nevertheless be willing to go along with an adjournment entirely to avoid having to vote up or down on, say, Kash Patel or Mike Flynn or the like. That exact institutional cowardice, oh, I mean, he scratches out cowards, calculus, appears to be what President-elect Trump is counting upon. Finally, although the commentary thus far has been focused on executive branch offices, in a world, in a world, I like to do that in the movie voice, in the world, where President Trump is able to use recess appointments at some point during his upcoming term, there is a separate and not fully settled question about whether that power extends to the appointment of Article 3 federal judges, including Supreme Court justices. What do you know? We've predicted the, the issue here. The complication arises from the seeming conflict between Article 3's mandate that judges and justices, you know it, I told you, shall hold their offices during good behavior, lifetime appointments, and the mandate of the Recess Appointments Clause that their commission would expire at the end of the next session of the Senate, regardless of how good their behavior has been, the conflict notwithstanding, historically there have 
been a number of recess-appointed federal judges, including 14 Supreme Court justices. Can you believe it? The understanding, though, animating all of those appointments is that they are temporary and expire absent Senate confirmation, notwithstanding the good behavior clause of Article 3. Thus, although lower courts have rejected constitutional challenges to the recess appointment of Article 3 judges, most recently when the Unbank 11th Circuit in 2004 rejected a challenge to the appointment of now Chief Judge William Pryor, The assumption all along has been that those commissions expire when any other recess appointment does, i.e. at the end of the next session of the Senate. The most recent example in support of this understanding also comes from 2004 when Judge Charles Pickering, who received a recess appointment to the Fifth Circuit in January of that year, resigned in December when it became clear that he was not going to be confirmed. And most famously, the second Chief Justice of the United States, John Rutledge, was rejected by the Senate, 14 to 10, that was a small Senate way back then, after he had been recess appointed by President George Washington. Rutledge, too, resigned before the Senate's session formally ended, so both Early and consistent historical practice support this understanding that recess appointments of Article III judges and justices are constitutional and that they are brief. Of course, just because something is constitutional doesn't mean it's a good idea. And also, by the way, doesn't mean it's still constitutional when this court gets a hold of it. The Senate even adopted a sense of the Senate resolution in 1960 specifically arguing otherwise with respect to recess appointments of Supreme Court justices. After all, a recess-appointed judge or justice remains dependent upon both the President and the Senate for their permanent confirmation and therefore lacks the independence until that point where they're permanently appointed that Article 3 seeks to create or require of the judges. But here we are. And so it's impossible, or rather, I'm sorry, so it's possible that Justice Potter Stewart will not be the last Supreme Court justice to receive a recess appointment. The upshot of all this is that, for better or for worse, the Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court in 2014, gives the President remarkably broad power to end-run the Senate's role in appointments so long as a majority of the Senate goes along with it. And that appointment power includes at least temporary appointments of Supreme Court justices and lower court judges. Not for the first time, and I fear not for the last, we may soon be exposed to yet another critical way in which the constraint that had previously reigned in abusive behavior by presidents turns out to have been a political norm rather than a constitutional rule. Wow. How do you like that? Now, Uh, Since there are only a few minutes left, we might as well continue with his other notes on this. There's a SCOTUS trivia, the recess, 14 recess appointed justices. As noted above, starting with Chief Justice Rutledge, there have been 14 Supreme Court justices initially named to the court via a recess appointment. What's noteworthy about that list is that with the exception of the three Eisenhower examples, which came in a bunch, the only recess appointments to post-date the Civil War was that of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1902. Went on to become something of a big deal, as it turns out. Just for posterity, here's the list, according to John S. Castellano's 1963 student comment. Here they are. In case you want to know, Justice Thomas Johnson, serving from 1791 to 93. Chief Justice Rutledge in 1795. Justice Bushrod Washington. Yes, that Washington. From 1798, uh, by the way, later confirmed, I guess, because he served until 1829. Justice Alfred Moore, 1799. Justice Henry Livingston, 1806, went on till 1823. Justice Smith Thompson, 1823, maybe he replaced that guy and served another 20 years. Justice John McKinley, Justice Levi Woodbury, ever heard any of these guys? You know, probably not. Justice Benjamin Curtis, Justice David Davis, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, that guy we have heard of. How about this one for you? Chief Justice Earl Warren. Did you remember that one? 1953, served until 1969. And then some others you may have heard of, including the last one, Justice Potter Stewart and 
right before him, Justice William Brennan. So at least some people were familiar with from the modern era. Uh, so, wow. Uh, look out for that one. And I don't know, just I thought uh, an interesting and early uh, opportunity for Trump to jump straight out and uh, neuter the Congress and get rid of another previously important and meaningful section of the Constitution, advice and consent. All the things you learned about in civics class back when they had such things, uh, all now obsolete. And remember, it was the framers' idea that, of course, the members of Congress, even though they were members of the same political party, would jealously guard their prerogatives and the, what power they were afforded, and they were afforded a lot in the original, uh, and not willingly surrender it on a partisan basis to a different branch. But I guess that's out the window now. And now he can extract promises from people running to lead that branch that I will neuter it, I will give away our power, and he is applauded for it. Not only is he applauded for demanding it, but the leader candidates are applauded for knuckling under in doing so. Why would they be applauded for it? Because, again, he intends to appoint people who will be 100% radioactive. And if they can avoid it and never have an up or down vote on whether or not that person should actually be in office, they can say, it wasn't up to me. I mean, hey, I would have stopped that guy. Why don't you find uh, Mike Flynn arrested again for more espionage? Didn't you vote for him to be national security advisor? Don't you feel bad about that? I didn't vote for him. I, I would have voted no if they'd had a vote, but what can I tell you? They didn't have a vote. He was appointed during a recess. Well... Now that they see it coming, you can blame them for it. And even if they didn't see it coming, you could blame them for it. You would say, what are you, some kind of an idiot? Did you know this was going to happen? It's a useful line. See if you can say it uh, and uh, keep it in pocket for as long as it's legal to say things like that to members of the Republican Party. From NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to KGRO in the morning. All right, so there was about 800,000 other things I wanted to get to today, and I focused on this one. It's an important one, but nevertheless, do not do not fear. Justice Putnam rides to the rescue of the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy next right here on Networks Radio. He'll be rounding up, well, uh, let's say uh, 65 to 80% of the rest of the stories that we didn't get to today. Stay tuned. See you tomorrow.